and videos and articles and images. We spend a lot of time making sure the accurate information gets out. This is live, it's still lava moving. They weren't just sharing a story, they were helping their neighbor. If a family was being evacuated, my group would just jump in and help out. So it was huge. They were watching out for each other. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you for the support from everybody. As we go through this, we're growing closer together as a community. When tragedies like this strike, you really realize how much you need each other. Aloha everyone. Welcome to our weekly update on July 1st for both of our volcanoes. I'm here with geologist Phil Fong. I'm Dane DuPont. We're going to do a little bit of an update for you. How you doing, Phil? Yep. Um... We are going to be doing a, a video uh, premiere after this live stream. It might not be immediately afterwards, but we will be premiering it. And it's a video project has been working on for about a month and a half now. Um, proud of it, and I hope it, uh, it's impactful. Let's people know a little bit more about the recovery process from the 2018 eruption from, a, from the perspective of those that live in the area and have family lineage from the area. So yeah, check that out afterwards. Oh. Well, go ahead. Uh, we couldn't hear you there. Um, I think I got oh. it fixed now. We'll test it out. I'm we'll watching chat. Uh, we couldn't hear All right, you yep, there. that's um, it. I think we I got, got it. it. All right. Try again there, huh? Oh. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, uh, we'll talk about our two volcanoes today, and, yeah, let Dane know if you have any issues with our stream on a, on a chat, and otherwise he will... Uh, try to answer what questions they can in there, and we'll do a round of questions here at the end of our volcano update. And we'll look at some of the data for the volcanoes today. It's there's not a whole 
lot different this past week than the week prior. Um, but a couple little changes, and we'll note them just because you know no two weeks are ever exactly the same. Um, there's some minor changes, but not a whole lot of uh, uh, news, so to speak, per se, right? But we'll look at what there is that's interesting. So um, that's the view, view we have here of the volcano on the 25th. That's the one released image. And we can move on to the, uh, the next uh, image we have, which is the view from the KW camera. The view down into the down drop cutter of four from the west. And no changes there either, but just to kind of cycle through, that's the, the other visible view we, that we can see. And you see that the, the left side of that crater there is the is getting pretty yellow down there where all those gas vents are continuing to to effuse uh, a lot of sulfur dioxide, uh, more so on that northern side, uh, but also a little bit on that southern side. There's a couple of spots you can kind of see there. And also the west vent as well is still fuming. So that's the source of that gas we saw in that previous photograph. It was released by USGS, and that's the visible uh, equivalent here. And... Yeah, and then, and then advancing to the to the, ne to the, the next view um, is the F1 thermal camera. So same view as that KW camera we just saw. And you see that there are still a couple of little hot spots there. There's the, the, at the bottom, that's the west vent. There's a couple of spots near the west vent right in there that are spots of that lava lake. But there's one day, and I don't know if you can uh, pick it out. Like It's kind of on the upper right, maybe like at 2 o'clock on the clock of that lava lake in there that's a tiny tiny little point that's brighter right on the, on the edge yeah, right yeah there it is right in there and that's an interesting one that's that possibly is visible from the other angle and there's a couple other ones of those there's one a little bit further down down around clockwise around the perimeter there's one maybe if you go all the way past 12 o'clock on a clock counterclockwise so maybe like 11 o'clock maybe there's one over there as well and maybe there's one over somewhere around eight o'clock it's and there's 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 a lot of these little spots and depending on the angle you may or not see them so we did want to point out that if you uh, look at that bw or b1 camera view um, from the south as our our dedicated uh collabor collaborator Marin purvis has here she's picked out another spot of glow there and i don't know if it's possible to zoom into that zoom into that thing but that little tiny little spot right there that circle it is one example of these very rare intermittent glow caught, caught on these nighttime views of these webcams. So um, if we flip to the daytime view uh, that we just saw today, um, you can see that that's right along that from this, we're now looking from the east in this camera view. So we're actually uh, looking at that south edge there. So that's that bright one that was around two o'clock I just had to point out, I think somewhere in that range in there. And it just so happens that it became Whatever, whatever, I mean, whatever adjustment of the ground is happening, subsidence that's very slight still. Maybe it's allowing that glow to be more visible directly for the camera, or the camera settings are changing around dusk and dawn. It's hard to tell exactly what's going on there, but you know, certainly if you were down there and able to look at it with your eye, you might see more of these hotter glowing spots than that is actually being, being picked up by by the cameras. And once in a while, it does get picked up by the cameras. So there it is. The, B1 camera Mahalo Marin once again. So rare to see, but still happening. Uh, not really noted in the USGS update, but USGS update is still there uh, for our reference and as our our source of uh, main information here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So really, the, there's been no new SO2 emission measurements since June 16th. So nothing in the last week. And still, net range uh, was 70 tons per day of that of being in that that background state as new background states since the 2021 eruption and otherwise there's really not a whole lot of change in there you know the, um they, they do note um what we've been noting for the last couple of weeks now they do say finally that seismicity has been slowly increasing in recent weeks and they note the small swarm of earthquakes in summit region on june 23rd that we noted in our last week's update that was not noted by the usgs update since their update comes out on tuesdays so Tuesday to Tuesday, they caught their seismicity comes into this report. So uh, otherwise, uh, um, nothing really notable there. You know, there's. Uh, I would like to see if I could put out if anyone is listening. You know, and I'm sure they have this on their field agenda there. But you know, um, we'd love to see more measurements of SO2 from the pool oil and East Rift area, even if the values reported are low values for the comfort of the people who are living down Rift, right? Just to 
reassure if there's not anything you know sneaky happening and one more set of data to reassure in any case uh, they're still referencing referencing so2 measurements from January 7th on uh, East rifts and observations there so we can move on from that and really the more interesting thing here is is if we go down and first look at the tilt that we're, we are going through uh, uh, another deflation inflation event coming out of here in the last week we've had lots of small ones we've gone from a pattern of the background ones being large frequent or large infrequent big ones maybe one week two looks like we've had coming out of the one big one earlier last week one two three smaller ones since then and so we've essentially more frequent smaller deflation inflation events still in the background it's still nothing we can really tie to a change at the surface but interesting to keep observing since there's not a whole lot else to talk about and that you, that pattern is more evident in that one month view that you can see at the bottom there. So seeing that first half of the plot the, on the left hand side with the two bigger, three, you know, three bigger, less frequent deflation inflation events with a background trend that was rising in fact. And then since that middle of the month, the last two weeks, that's the more notable thing is essentially the baseline until it's been flat, if not possibly slightly decreasing and hard to see past all the background deflation inflations. So right. certainly not climbing like it was before. Interesting part to me, just looking at that, is the DI events prior to January 26th and how normal they seem. And then we get these rapid fire, quick, small DI events following it, like three quick ones yeah, in yeah, succession. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that, that that may be some other other subsurface adjustment. It's not exactly deflation inflation, but you know, one thing that we that we've not seen a whole lot of variety of deflation inflation events here is that you know there used to be also the, the v-shaped events and maybe we're seeing those the larger u-shaped events and then smaller v-shaped events something like something like that whereas we're only seeing u's really for a long time and occasionally a rare v and there are some other stranger things that were documented during the pool era which we'll, we'll just ignore for now as well but um, interesting to see a little bit more variation for sure and we can't connect that to anything on the surface. It's just interesting to see that that's changing back and forth. And more interesting is the baseline essentially flattening there. And that's not just in, that G in, the, in the, the tilt. If you uh, go down to the GPS, you'll see that that's still the pattern in GPS is that there's been no summit expansion or contraction now over the past week, right? You do see a little bit of variation up and down that may correspond to those deflation inflation cycles at the far right in there. Um, but really, when it comes down to it, it's 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 if anything, maybe slightly contracting, which is really really unusual, right? So that's something we haven't seen um, really for a while, right? That actually have that, that kind of trend, maybe a little bit in the first couple of weeks of the 2020 eruption, but really that was a whole different kind of activity as we're having now. So it leads you to wonder, has some adjustment underground been, have we reached some kind of equilibrium? Um, if so, is it, how temporary is it? And what, what could change it to, towards some new state in the future? So, but essentially in, in terms of what we've been seeing Mauna Loa for a while, it's like it's, it's shifted into a neutral state right there with neither expansion nor contraction at the summit as shown by the GPS there. And then going down to the, the pool cone um, really the most noteworthy thing there is a scale, how small it is. That entire top to bottom plot would fit within one bar of that one above for the summit, right? One, one of those little bars. So it's really, um, really tiny scales and there's little adjustments and nothing we see there in the last week or two is really meaningful. Essentially it's, just, it's, it's, it's flat as we can tell within that, that range of the noise we're seeing. So nothing noteworthy there really either right and that's that's interesting as well so going to the earthquakes uh this is where we can see that the volcano is still uh active and things are still happening within it this is a sign of life perhaps when we look at the earthquakes for the past week here um, on a map view and you can see that there's over 400 what does it say there 400 and 38 maybe 400 something or somewhere right? over 400 events on it on a, on a map there, yeah. And uh, uh, mostly they're around the summit. And that's similar to last week. We're still missing. We're not having as many events in an upper east rift connector, although there is there is still some activity. There. See that one orange dot right in there. Um, we do still see activity on the south flank, and the larger events still happening south of that upper east rift connector and upper east rift segment bend by Mauna Ulu. 
although you see smaller um, events being picked up all the way down to nearly line eight, right? And so the, if anyone is, is religiously following the USGS earthquake alerts, you now there are some that popped up with some Leilani references references in there uh, due to being down in that area, but it's nothing alarming and it's nothing um, to be concerned about as far as, act, as, as, as act, eruption happening. It's a different pattern. It's a pattern of the south flank moving. And the whole thing is connected uh, in various uh, intricate ways there. So um, something to keep an eye on for sure. But um, uh, what we're seeing essentially is a soft flank showing movement and no, no pattern of, of activity on the East Rift anywhere from Honolulu down is a big gap. So uh, south flank perhaps is is allowing the volume of those magma reservoirs at the summit and upper East Rift to, to expand a little bit, to increase a little bit. And maybe that's... You know, that's that's one possible explanation, not the only one for sure, of why you might see that stalling of the expansion of the GPS and concentration of those earthquakes in the summit region. So, but that that's what's going on now. We basically are still waiting. We're in a wait and see, and we're waiting and seeing some more. And if we're going back to our over and under of three months until lava comes out again, you know, now it's looking a little bit more on a longer end of things. Um, if you take the last week as your guide rather than the previous week, same time a month ago. It's a very interesting to note that. We'll just wait, wait and see what develops next. And so in context, move on to the next slide, Dane. Um, that will be the earthquake rates and depths for the past month there. So you can see that really um, we had two peaks within the last month. One in the middle was that deep, deep Pala cluster that came in that we talked about last week. And then that one more recently on the 23rd is under the summit uh, cluster that was referenced by the USGS update just just recently we read to you guys and we referred to it last week and really since then it's been fairly level constant but still slightly elevated we'll call it levels that we're seeing here right so if you look back to the, the first part of the month we certainly have peaks and uh, we have you know peaks and valleys there and we're ranging somewhere from 70 to close to 40 earthquakes per day in that range you know and so that's that elevated level there and we're still maintaining that more or less here. We had a little bit more of a valley in the last week, um, down around 40, but still we'll come back up to it. And if you advance to the next slide and see how it fits into the whole the whole year, you can see that at the right end of the graph there, we're still um, fairly high compared to the period of eruption. That's that gap that occurs between uh, this, uh, January 2021 and June 2021. And so we're essentially somewhat in that equivalent era of what we're seeing perhaps in August to September to October uh, 2020 in those ranges of, of elevated, slightly elevated activity compared to having very low activity like we saw in the first part of the year. So that's the context of it. And um, not a whole lot of change happening quickly. If anything, it's maybe, maybe taking a breath and making us wait a little bit longer for the next move there. So looking at the earthquakes for the island here, and looking at Kilauea first, you can see there's a, the earthquakes around the summit and some of those around that south flank region just, just below there. Still activity happening at the deep Pahala zone at the bottom left of the image there. That's kind of ongoing. We don't talk about it all, all the time because it, it's something we talked about uh, many, many times before. And that's really the activity on Kilauea. And if you zoom out, Dane, we can maybe tie it into Mauna Loa here because Elsewhere on that map, you can see northwest of Mauna Summit, there's a new little cluster of earthquakes there. It might, it might only be less than 20 events in total, something like that, that there might be, might be at the tail end of it right now, but it essentially ended last night. Um, just northwest of the summit, nothing major. I, mean, I think the biggest one might have been a 2.2, something, something like that. And nothing alarming, just a little, little bit of a, I don't know, almost like a flare-up that's just showing that there is a, still adjustment of that shallower area of the volcano that expresses in that northwest flank there. So nothing alarming there. We can go, go through the graphs to kind of wrap it up here before we take our questions and just show you how that fits in the context of things. Well, one, uh, one little and... statement about this little spot is there's really three spots that we look at for common earthquake activity on the, at the summit of Mauna Loa. And this is one of them right here, this area. We've seen uh, little flurries of earthquakes here since the 2018 eruption of Kilauea as well. Um, and as you said, the, the largest one is 2.2, and there were 19 events. Yeah, 
Awesome. Yeah. So that's 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 exactly a, a common spot. It's popped up again here. You can see it here in the past week of Mauna Loa earthquakes on the USGS. And there it is. You can see a little bit of background peppering activity on that southeast side of the caldera too. So that southeast, southeast flank activity is still ongoing. You see a little bit of it here in the summit region, but probably a lot more of the south flank outside of this uh, uh, area of this map um, is occurring as well. So if we advance and we, we can actually see um, the whole past month and uh, we can see that there were that there's still quite a bit of that southeast activity happening for the past month, as well as that shallower, uh, larger earthquake under the upper southwest rift area there, and that kind of is that overall the same pattern we've been seeing for much of the past year. Mauna Loa is just a matter of like what order and how intense is it in each of the regions there. So it's now happening at very very low intensity levels, but it's still happening on, on that northwest flank and it's still happening on the southeast flank. And it's still happening shallow underneath the upper southwest rift. Well, we're not seeing it as much as shallow underneath the caldera area. And that's something that we may see change. Um, that's, a, that, that's kind of the, the last piece of last area there that might show up on this longer term map here. So but if we scroll down and we get down to the rates and depths for the past month, we can see here that that last little, little flurry gave us a spike of 25 earthquakes per day here for yesterday. Into the bar graph is uh, where, I'm, where I'm looking. Yeah, there it is. And uh, so, yeah, that's the 25 per day. And you see there are a couple of little, little ones before, but it really, it's been pretty low level activity. And that's really, you know, it really, if we advance to the next slide to see the rates for the past year, um, it's a little bit better perspective because you can still see that per week, we're still down. We're just able to maintain that level and just kind of shifting the patterns of, of them around. And we're nowhere near having those those high levels that we were seeing earlier in the year, and uh, even a little bit some last year. Yeah, and just one little thing is if we were talking about an eruption sequence and the amount of earthquakes that we'd expect, we'd be talking hundreds an hour or hundreds of day uh, earthquakes or even thousands of day in a day. It's This is just, you know, really small amounts of seismic activity but it's still awake you still get these quakes because you know it's that is kind of you know what is background level at we get back into that discussion what is background level at Mauna Loa how many earthquakes and how much deformation makes it uh fits into background all right yeah perfect yeah yeah I think great great, great reminder for our audience there so yeah we can look at the the cross caldera distance change, the GPS at Mauna Loa Summit as well. And you can see that it also is not really changing a whole lot. Uh, it's really been in, in that neutral, maybe slightly expanding phase really since mid-April. you know mid -April. And nothing to report there either. So really all that's happening at Mauna Loa that's, that's evident on the monitors is that little uh, addition of earthquake flurry in the northwest flank. Um, and if you advance, we can see uh, the actual official USGS update where they give us the statistics there. And they say that really nothing has really changed. They do say that there were 172 small magnitude earthquakes under the mountain in the past week. And of those, 79 been, uh, below the summit upper elevation flanks. So that 79 is a little bit of a jump. That's that jump that's mostly from that little uh, cluster to the northwest. And still we have 92 others under the southeast flank all less than magnitude three and mostly at depths less than eight kilometers, five miles below ground level. Can you maybe so, clarify no surprise there. what the 92 mm -hmm. under the south, the southeast flank means? Like what uh, specifically earthquakes are we talking about? I can pull up the map if we need to. Yeah, so yeah, you, you, uh, go, go ahead and pull up the map. Um, the tricky thing is that that USGS map there has a magnitude threshold of about 1.7 for the most part for some of those earthquakes. It depends on which region, right? Some of those minor low earthquakes are coming in at 0 0.9 perhaps, but if you go down to the Kilauea area, like around um, Kawiki area, for example, uh, you know, you, you won't see any events over there. Um, let, let's, you know, to, to make it more clear, let, let's go go to the southeast of Mauna Loa Summit, southeast of Mokua Veo Veo, right in that boundary area there. 
And like on this map, you really see no no earthquakes anywhere in that area. But the map we just saw of Mauna Loa Summit for the last month and the last week um, shows those earthquakes there, right? So those earthquakes, those little ones that are plotting on that map are not getting put through all the way to that that other page that we were, that we're looking at. So they're getting filtered out. But they're not filtered out from the USGS map and from the USGS counts, right? So when USGS is counting, they're counting those little things. And unfortunately, that si- if you know if you look at the size of the caldera and that little size of that little rectangle of map there, and you compare that to the size of the other view that we're looking at, right? When we can see the whole island and see Kilauea alongside it as well, it's that you know that little square is a tiny piece of the mountain, and most of those earthquakes are happening. Outside of that square and outside of the Kilauea square, also in that in that no man's land in between. Right. All right. Thank you. Just yeah, might as well make that clarification here now. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, that's 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 the the record ninety two under the southeast flank this week, and that's you know kind of similar. So there there are some weeks where you see everything under the summit and some where they're split between the summit and the flank, and almost always it's been the southeast flank moving. And so here we are for this may be the third or fourth week in a row now, this split between the summit and the southeast flank. And this just shows that the volcano is still adjusting without needing to have a big earthquake, without having to have a big eruption. And all that's happening, and it's evident by this low-level activity in these areas. So that's interesting, of course, to us, because uh, that means it's essentially buying time, right? It's not at a, at a stage anywhere near a state of failure, apparently, at this point in time. So that's the uh, official Mauna Loa report. There's one last thing to mention, which is that this week's USGS Volcano Watch uh, will be posted shortly on hawaiitracker.com. And it is about volcanoes in Canada. And I do talk about analogs to Hawaii and basaltic eruptions, which happen all over the world, of course. And uh, since basaltic eruptions happen in kind of a, a vacuum, we'll call it here in Hawaii, right there, we, we have a, a a blank canvas that we're we're painting our volcano on, as opposed to this whole geologic complexity of history that you get on continents um, that you often, you know, you have in Canada and elsewhere in the world as well. So uh, Hawaii is maybe one, of, you know, one of the least complicated with with those extra facets of it but you know um anywhere else in the world you see places like canada and you see you, know, you might see cinder cones that look like hawaii like right? fisher 22 shown in that image there in the bottom and compared to that uh image of uh which one is that, that one at the top that is eve cone uh, and mount Itziza volcanic field in northern bc so check that out if you guys want to see some analogs and uh with that we'll just remind you guys we're brought, brought to you by hawaiitracker.com and We'll say our thank yous and take some questions and then we'll talk about um, revitalizing Puna a little bit more before we we uh, premiere that video. What do you think, right. Dane? Yeah, um, I do want to thank some sponsors of ours. I want to thank first uh, Kaleo's Bar and Grill in the heart of Pahoa, giving some unique twists on some uh, traditional dishes with a little bit of a local kind flair. In, indoor, outdoor dining, COVID safe policies, all that kind of stuff. It's really a... Uh, Great place for visitors and locals to go. I go there regularly. Uh, their fish and chips, especially when it's mahi mahi, is just killer. Good, good stuff there. Uh, recommended by us. Really good. Uh, appreciate their sponsorship as well. We see some of the posts that we've had on Tracker. And then uh, Kalani Tours. I want to thank them as well. Uh, premier luxury tour. Doing some very small, intimate tours with uh, small groups to give that personalized uh, touch to the tour experience instead of those big tour buses where they just jam everybody in like sardines. These guys, they really go that extra mile to make sure people understand and get to see some of the sites that maybe you wouldn't otherwise. And they do uh, waterfall tours, they do lava tours, and they also do a Kona coffee farm tour. Uh, Really good stuff, and we appreciate them as a sponsor as well. Do want to also thank everybody that has been making donations on hawaiitracker.com. You can make those on hawaiitracker.com slash support. Those donations really help keep this stream going, help keeping our updates on Hawaii Tracker coming, 
uh, the small donations really go a long ways, and we appreciate everybody. Speaking of that, we did have a $5 super chat from Two Pineapples who said, Mahalo for your time, the time you take to keep us all updated. Appreciate that support. And uh, if you want to support this channel, the best thing you can do right now is to share this video, right? So sharing the video to your network of friends on social media is really the best way to get this type of message out there and get the eyes on it and help the channel grow. Uh, we also, subscribing, liking the video really helps as well. But yeah, thick, if you really want to help it out, just share the video. It goes a long ways. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's... there's yeah, that, that person who's, you know, always asking you what's going on with the volcano or or trying trying to think about uh, what what could it be doing next? What does this actually mean, right? That kind of person that you may yeah, you may know that may not have heard of us, uh, that's the person we'd love you to share our channel with. That's you know, there are a lot of, of, of us who are like minded on island and not just island but worldwide as well. So but especially in island, especially island residents we're hoping to reach. Um, Please, uh, but yeah, if there's someone in mind that you can think of right away when I'm saying this, you know who I'm talking about, uh, please go, go do that now. We really, really appreciate it. All right. Ready to get into some questions then? Yeah, let's have some, have a little discussion here. We do have a, another super chat from Joey Smallwood who says, thank you for all the knowledge. Uh, appreciate the super chat. We got a few questions Apology. here. Not a whole lot. Uh, Richard asks, is it possible to tell the difference between a shield volcano and a stratovolcano just by looking at the seismic tremor data? Or any earthquake signals? Just by the seismic tremor data. Let's just expand it to any earthquake signals, really. Is there a unique anything unique about the earthquakes on a strato versus a shield that you can think of off the top of that? I, well, uh, no. Um, but I... At, 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 that's a question that's essentially exceeding my level of ex expertise. I have to say there, you know, I mean, there, there could be something, for example, that's on a spectral signal that I'm just not aware of because I haven't studied that level of detail of differences. Right. Um, a great question. If I, if we do hear anything about that, I will certainly add to it. Um, traditionally as we, you know, as, as education goes before spectrograms, you don't really see, I mean, the, you see the similar kind of patterns as far as swarms and migration and all of that. So um, a lot of similar similarities, more similarities and differences, and perhaps the differences, if so, are more subtle. Something you might see in the different frequencies of the earthquakes or something like that. And that's that's the best I can offer. All right, Dorothy asks, how long does it take for the SO two gas to create the yellowing the yellowing on the lava rocks? So near the the fumaroles, near the eruptive vents, near the just the gas vents, the cracks in the in the ground that uh, emit SO two. That's another great question that I really, I really can't say, you know, very scientifically to answer that. I mean, it seems like we we're watching it happen now. Um, we watched it happen a little bit after the collapse of 2018, didn't we, Dane? I mean, yeah. how long, how long would you say it took till we saw those those spots becoming really whitish and yellow? It's probably about a month, a few months, maybe. Right. What do you think? The the first thing that jumps out to me is the SO2, the yellow yellowing effect, is much more rapid than the white, the the calcium uh, mm -hmm. deposits that appear on them. And the, the one that really blew my mind was in 2018 was how fast those SO2 deposits and how thick they would uh, just right on the eruptive vents. They would get, you remember we saw the ones after the eruption that had crystallized structures on them, uh, just out of all SO2 almost. Just incredible mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, those ones seemed like they were in the, in the realm of days to weeks when the SO2 mm -hmm. yellowing mm -hmm. effect happened. And I assume that just was Right, directly, the, yeah tremendous amount of so2 coming out as well so that it was that those some of those yeah. things were bright bright yellow um it really is like directly how, over the vent right directly over the vent a ton of so2 and they would just yellow out really quickly and with a just a huge deposit of uh, sulfur the yeah that the, the summit and they, were, they were smaller longer um not as bright right. Right. So, I mean, it, you know, if, if we stay around the Ahuayla area, weren't, there were other patches that, that developed yellowness or whiteness after a while. What's the timeline on those? The, the whiteness I started, the, the calcium deposits I started seeing uh, probably a month after the eruption ended the, it, where they were noticeable. Right. You could probably go out there and if you were really looking, see them sooner than that. But that's from where I remember them really popping up. Um, and those would happen on the sides of the lava channel. Right. Like the after the lava channel drained out and the eruption uh, ceased or waned out, it 
you'd start seeing that white appear, whereas the, the, the SO2 yellow was appearing mostly from the eruption, like during the eruption, and then after the eruption ended, you didn't really see much of in the way of new deposits being formed. If they were, they were just adding mm-hmm. to the already thick ones, like at Fisher 23, one of the ones that we went and saw. Right, yeah. So that, I think that, that brings up some inter- interesting points of it, right? The actual emission rate makes a big difference. So, I mean, depending on what, what your source of it is, if it's a surface flow or whether it's a deep, if, it, if it's a magma body, if it's a dike, or if it's the whole magma chamber, it can have more built up SO2, right? And certainly under the magma chamber or under the summit, you can have that SO2 source still coming up and in. Um, of course, uh, I mean, one, one thing that's interesting that I can relate is that when you look at, at the... Um, growth of these crystals in, in cave environments that you sometimes see them actually growing and sometimes they actually are dissolving um, depending on relative humidity in the air and those kind of environmental factors so there could be some other other environmental factors as play as well so if you have a giant rainstorm you could possibly uh, erode or dissolve some, some of it away um, but that of course has to be compared to the emission rate and uh, the amount of interactions you can have, have between those things right so um interesting to think about but yeah that's that's your ballpark there you know um if you're maybe directly over the van it could be days to weeks and if you're elsewhere then maybe you're talking about weeks to months maybe that's the best we can we can do there Makes sense. um certainly if they keep getting yellower yellower more and more and more and more and more, and more continually then that gives a good indication that there's a there's a gas pathway to the magma chamber or some larger magma source there and that can sit there that way for a long time. You know, there are areas that have had lots of uh, uh, um, sulfur deposits on the surface and lots of gas emissions that uh, has killed vegetation and other other things like that that has still not erupted after um, close to 100 years. You know, so um, I don't think that's going to happen in that bullseye of the summit caldera. Um, but and, and certainly we know that underneath there, there's that... that shallow magma chamber still and that's likely the source of it, i guess so it's likely to get yellower yellower and yellower and yellower and it's interesting maybe where it's happening more that northern side so that's that's the side that it's easier to get. that's more cracked perhaps right that's an interesting thing to think about there denise asks a question uh what it's the surface area of a fault for something like a 1.0 earthquake can you maybe explain kind of at the high le- or at a general level how those faults interact and how you might be able to get small earthquakes or large earthquakes from a certain fault yeah so i mean it's it's i mean she's 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 got the intu- intuition part of it right right it, the, the actual size of the area of the fault that's moving that's breaking rupturing um is directly proportional to the energy release and the size of the earthquake um and it's hard i don't i don't it's hard, without having some um notes in front of me it's hard to, to answer that exactly how big a patch would you get for a 1.0 or, or a 2.0 or what have you right you know um you certainly know that that's that it's an exponential scale so that when you get to the sixes and sevens you're talking about you know um yeah big patches we're gonna yeah. we're i think we're talking about a patch that was something like you know 10 by 20 miles possibly being affected right and you know um we we used to think of you know we used to model it essentially as it being one patch that actually broke and everything around it stayed the same. But now we know that there's like one patch in the middle that moves the most, and everything around it moves a little bit less. But the effect kind of is spread out over a larger area, and so the area that's affected may not be expected to be as large of a range. And so you might have an average movement over that whole area, with a maximum movement at some core part of it. And that's usually how we how we. Uh, try to describe it right you know um but it, it does get kind of kind of detailed and um, kind of getting lost in the weeds here a little bit yeah so hmm. may, maybe i can in, in a future for maybe next for next, for next week if you remind me remind me dan give me some homework to pull out yeah. the notes on that then i can give you an example on that okay. yeah so th- thanks for that denise andrew is asking uh can you what's up with your digs you seem to be in a different spot from last week and the week before so maybe just let people know where you are oh that's classified for another week <laughs> then i'll then I'll, I'll share some more but uh, uh doing some research all right um 
I believe that's about all we have. We have one more from Victoria that asks about the uh, earthquakes under Kilauea and how many, um, there was, what, 430-something we were looking at for the last week. Can you explain, mm -hmm. can you explain maybe what is, um, what is background levels on Kilauea that we are aware of, like maybe the post-2018 period? We don't have those exact numbers up for the earthquake activity but i can pull no but if you go, if you go to that that earthquakes per, that one with the yeah the yearly graph that one might be yeah, might be one. pretty good right because that that one's giving us a scale on a side of earthquakes per week and you can see that that 400 number is about what we were at at the beginning of a year ago right so if you look at the left end of the graph 400 is right about where that top of that blue is right in there and you can see that there are kind of two peaks beyond that but that's that's that elevated background and so that's what we we've been at since june and so while you know one new nuance of this graph that we I didn't go into today we've done it before we can do it again now is that that rightmost little bar is not full week yet so it's it's always going to be shorter than than everything to the left of it and to get a more representative count of what 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 the what the rates were for the last week you can look at that map and that map is measuring not just you know uh per week that's per whatever buckets on that plot but just from whatever day you load the map whatever time you load the map so we can we basically can still see where we're still in a 400 earthquakes per week range even if it's not showing up on that map quite so neatly there because that's all just computer generated so um that's 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 where that that's why that number matters and that's why i pointed it out is essentially because of that and um we are at that slightly limited rate similar to as we were earlier in that, on that plot and not during the eruption right so the reason that's that's interesting is because if we saw if we saw the gps is essentially flat flatlined and the tilt is basically flatlined but the earthquakes are not flatlined and that's the point of it is that that it's still elevated and it's still showing signs of change and so we're still just waiting to see what the next move of the system is right well that does it basically for the questions that we have here for today that I see at least. So um, I do want to say one last thing about the Kilauea recovery video that we're going to be premiering. It was brought to you by Malama Opuna, secured through a grant uh, through the White County and Councilwoman Ashley Kirkowitz. It, we're trying to, in this video, tell the story of the eruption recovery process without us actually talking. So you're not going to hear Philip or myself in this video. It's all community members that have stake or uh, long-standing ties to the area and letting it uh, the story be told through their words but there is a little hidden challenge in there it's like a where's waldo hunt philip and i do appear in the video at certain spots we don't talk and we're kind of in the background if you see us just throw a timestamp in the in the comments and just uh, maybe you'll see us maybe you won't but yeah that basically sums up uh, for this update we will be premiering that video uh a little bit after this video ends give us a little bit of time to get that up and running and out there but yeah check them out all right well, we yeah my holiday and thanks for that yep yeah, we have a one last super chat just came through dorothy with a 24.99 super chat says thank you for sharing your knowledge appreciate it dorothy appreciate yeah. all the support everybody and that'll do it for me um pass it off to philip to end it out yeah, mahalo, Dane. Mahalo, Dorothy. Mahalo, all, everyone else has contributed. Uh, those of you guys who have, haven't shut it out today, but uh, uh, have contributed in the past, mahalo you guys as well, too. I'm sure you will uh, contribute when you can, and if you can at least share the video like we talked about before, that'd be fantastic. And yeah, we, you know, volcanoes are, are slow, but we'll keep our eye on them as usual, and we'll be back once again next week. So that'll be July 8th on Thursday once again, um, same time. Same place. Uh, we'll uh, maybe go into some more uh, some more tangents that that we can load up since there's not as much other stuff happening in the foreground here. So um, until then, um, from HawaiiTracker.com, he is Dan Dupont. I am Philip Ong. Aloha, everyone. <laughs>